Hello and welcome back to Soul Listens. Today, Soul is listening to our friend Gregory D. S. Anderson, PhD, who is the president and founder of Living Tongues Institute for Endangered Languages. This is serious stuff here. I'm going to ask you because I think you're an expert on the subject, so you're probably a good source for this. <laughs> I hope so. About how many languages are there in the world? Oh, um, yeah, it's a great question, and it's a difficult question to answer. Uh, and you're the one who would know that, too. Right, <laughs> right. So we can say there's somewhere between 6 and 7,000, 6,000 and 7,200. So let's say roughly 7,000 total. as a About 7,000 languages. Right. And there are how many countries? 190-something? Yeah, it's under 200. Under I don't know 200. the exact number. Under 200 countries. 7,000 languages. Right. That is, that is an awesome figure. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. Whoa. So you're traveling all over the world. You're recording right. and documenting languages that are in danger of dying out, some with right. literally only a few people who still exactly. speak them. Why do you <laughs> feel it's important to capture these languages before they disappear for good? Well, it's important for a bunch of different reasons. Um, it's important because... The, those languages, are we, so we're talking now about these tail end languages, as they're sometimes called, the ones that only have a handful of speakers. Even those languages are important because they contain a lot of information about the area that they're from and uh, the history of that region and those people that's never going to be recovered. And so like documenting them before they disappear sort of makes sense, regardless just for science as a sort of scientific value for the, the value of scientific linguistics. They also have value to future generations of communities because we know that often communities that give up their language, you see a three or four generational attitudinal shift where you get uh, those then current people really wishing they had their language back and wanting to have reclamation and stuff. And so you owe it to that, you know, from the perspective of someone like myself, definitely you'll be dead when those people would want that materials, you know, population to document language of their great great grandparents or whatever now when those people were still alive before they died. So that that's there there's a sort of twofold uh thing that that sort of salvage documentation you might call it, um or we call it, um that you know, you have for future generations of science, current generations of science, and future generations of whatever communities facing that sort of extinction phenomenon in their language. So um, now, so there's a human rights issue of why you would want to help languages try to re be restored because, you know, legally and morally languages uh, in most places, um, at least de facto, have the right to to assert their, their, their reality and to their continuation in, in, in whatever form, whether it's media, education, you know, whatever, however expressed, right? Um, so, you know, um, those are all reasons why people who have voices in the first, the first world should, you know, use those voices to make it known that this is something that a large number of communities are facing, but they're not a large number of people. So that, that's all like, with those 7,000 languages, you have to realize that like about half of them, um, over half actually, let's say 55, 60% of them are spoken by about 0.1 to 0.2% total of the world's population. So, um, but many know, would seem, feel yeah, insignificant. Yeah, their, their voices are often lost yeah. in, in in a sea of of even seeming diversity. Okay, so that's a problem. You know, you can have a country like Indonesia, for example, where you have, or the Philippines, where you have a handful or a dozen even of of sort of regional languages, which is great, right? 
but that underlying that is another like magnitude or more uh, in the case of Indonesia of diversity that gets that's getting lost uh, so that you know you're going from like in a place like the Philippines from say 120 or 150 languages to like eight and then in the a place like Indonesia from like 700 or 750 languages to more like a dozen so that you know there's like a massive attrition and sort of invisibilization of all of these sort of micro communities and um, you know so there's a there's a the issue is right now for for linguists or language activists is that just the, it, it's such a catastrophic decline point that we're on right now that that it's quite daunting and, and, and can be quite overwhelming. So, Do you consider yourself a language activist? Well, I'm a language activist in a very real sense, but in the sense that I was using it there would be someone who fights for their own language usually um, mm -hmm. and who is, yeah, like a, a member of that speech community rather than someone like myself who would be like a sort of a more like a... Um, spokesperson for well, you're an advocate certainly. an ad yeah, I'm so yeah an advocate yeah an yeah. advocate for, an ad for, advocate for, activist for, yeah an advocate for languages advocate for, yeah. for language diversity or well obviously kind of there's got to be something personal going on here you've devoted your life to this you started a nonprofit uh, yeah, yeah. around it right. you've, you've gone pretty deep in the studies and the writing <laughs> right so right. you obviously care about this right. issue of losing languages right. and protecting them right why is that so personal I, what, right. what, what do you feel is the value there right Right. It's an excellent question. Um, I just think that, you know, for whatever reason, I've identified with languages in yeah. some perverse way. It's like a calling. Ever since a child, being a little kid, right? You know, like seven, eight years old. And yeah. that's I, admittedly not normal, but yeah. it's just, yeah, I've just always been interested in, mm -hmm. in languages. And the more I realized how many different languages there were, and then I got to understand... When I was young, I didn't really understand. I was just, I was sort of fascinated by the diversity of language. And um, I also understood that there was like a strategic language and stuff like that. So like in, in, then in the 70s and 80s, you wanted to do Russian because that was like a cool slash st strategic language, right? So that would be the language you want to do. And German, of course, also was useful in that way. And French, Spanish, whatever. You know, these are the normal languages you'd take. That now people now it would be more like Chinese, Japanese, Arabic, wherever you have other options. But then we didn't have those, or we have taken them. But um, so I, you know, I took whatever I could. Um, you did. You're right. polylinguist from early on. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So like, I mean, early on, I tried to teach myself all kinds of you know exotic languages, which seemed exotic to me, which weren't exotic now. Rosaka. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they don't seem super exotic now, but they're. But 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 I was um, always interested in. Um, I don't know, the complexity of language, I guess. And so I was drawn to, once I started taking linguistics, I, I was drawn to American Indian languages, okay? And their languages are very, very interesting. And, um, you know, their, their historical, you know, situation, very tragic, and mm. you know, and... Beyond tragic. Right, exactly. And so it is, and, and also for whatever weird, reason i had a personal interest in native siberia and siberia and the conquest of siberia and how interesting siberia was and so for me because both in siberia and in in native american whether we're talking um, you know north american indians here in the u.s or first nations in canada or whatever these almost all of these languages were in danger by the time i was taking linguistics in the 1980s right so you know for me like the 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 study of language and the interesting stuff in language, it was always tied to languages that are at risk, right? So it sort of got ingrained in me sort of early on that that was what you had to do as something mm. useful. Yeah, you were, you were raised to care. Right. And you want to help protect something and right. save something. Well, I was a Boy Scout, right? <laughs> exactly. It's very right. Boy Scout of you to yeah, yeah. protect these, yeah, yeah. these languages. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Right. fascinating. You're right. a fascinating story. Right. <laughs> yeah. But here's an interesting thing is because here are all these languages. They, they enable, it's ironic because they enable us to communicate, which brings us together. But at the same time, there's 7,000 of them. In a way, it's almost kind of keeping us really compartmentalized by 
with whom you can communicate. You no, know, which, no, no, no. See, okay, so what that is right there, I'll tell you what it is. It's, it's, a, great, it's a great question. Yeah. But what it in, in embodies is a monolingual, what we call, I call, uh, a subtractive monolingual language ideology. Okay. That says everyone has one language. It's actually basically a, um, God, what was his name? Um, Lewis Henry Morgan. He was a I think 19th century sociologist. Anyway, Stalin picked this up. And that's where most of the 20th and 21st century ideas of ethnicity come from. Mm. Are this idea that you have this sort of one people, one place, one identity, one national soul or whatever, and one language and culture. What about one planetary soul? Yeah, yeah. But no, so that so for each one of these ethnoses, so defined as others by how, whatever, majority populations. Okay. So you and so when you have a, a, given an array of such peoples, you have the option of accepting that you're going to have either no interaction and thus no communication between them. You're going to have one language dominate all of them to the exclusion of all others, or you're going to have one language used by all of them uh, in the context of inter-ethnic uh, communication and not in other instances. Yeah, and keep their own still. Yeah, yeah. okay, right. So an additive bilingual or multilingual uh, uh, accept, you know, ideology mm. acceptance of that. So, so to, to assume that, um, you know, you have, it's not, no, what, so, so if we look at places where we have high language diversity, we also usually have high multilingualism. And so all that means is that people like to remain separate with a certain kind of identity and also interact and show social capital of a certain sort through multilingual interactions with different communities, showing their different density of social networks and thus social capital they've accrued through those social networks by knowing the language of different areas and peoples. So like that, that's, it's a very typical, but you can, I don't blame you because in America we have, we have the definition of a, subtractive monolingual ideology that we've consumed here okay so everyone's just like internalize it as like the thing yeah of course i would just speak that english well here th this is here you're, you're segueing right into our next uh, idea here which is quite clear through the work that our friend and geneticist spencer wells uh and many others of course have done is that we've been proven clearly to be all related to one another, right? right. As one human family. Absolutely. And so similar to how all the control towers in the world's international airports use the same language so they know communication will be possible, wouldn't it be easier for our entire human family to connect and comprehend each other if we settled on one language the world over? No. Maybe if it was that secondary one like you're saying, where we could all be bilingual, but there was one we all had in common and then we could keep our own? Or, you know, how the practicality of having something like a lingua franca that's used for international communication in the arena of um, air traffic control is different than wouldn't it be all just magical pixie dust and everyone gets along if we all spoke the same language? Right, because that's of course complete nonsense. Well, I mean that's it's, a little utopian, but just to be able to help but, each other, you know, even. So, here in the United States, where people who live in the same neighborhood, neighbors, the same next door to each other, may have slightly different ideologies with respect to say politics or religion, and they may share only one language they're both monolingual English speakers and yet they practically have zero common ground and zero ability to communicate so it doesn't matter if they share a language whatsoever um, differences are differences and languages are just vectors for social differences right mm -hmm. so I've played a bit with the translation apps in my phone 
Mm. And they seem to, to work pretty well for the languages that are there. Uh, how good are the professional grade translating softwares getting? And are we close to essentially being able to converse in real time with others, no matter the language anyway? You see it at the UN, they're all wearing the headset, they're hearing whatever the person's saying in their own language, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, how close are we to, to be able to do that? No, yeah, not very close, I would say, still. Unfortunately, the if you do even things like Spanish, <coughs> French, German, Russian, some of the languages that you expect to have Chinese, I guess. I haven't played with that one because I don't know that one. Um, but it it breaks down pretty fast over stretches of things, mm. um, and it often misses targets on things. So you really have to correct a lot of stuff. So <clears throat> I think, from what I understand, like a forty percent success rate is still pretty high in a in a automatic translation thing. Um, and so I don't know that for a fact. That might be an outdated um, number. Uh, so I, you know, that could be wrong. Well, does technology but, move really slow, or is it, it just certainly me? nowhere near 100 percent? Is my point. Even if it's like 60 percent or something yeah. now, it's like um, which would be great if it is. But I don't even think it's crossed the 50 percent threshold. But I could be wrong. These are that's with languages that are fairly exactly. formidably right. fleshed right. out. Right. Exactly. Like ones that have big corpora and that are big. European languages with, you know, a lot of stuff for it, this to, you know, potentially people and, and data that should be, you know, make, make that better than it is in theory, if it's not somehow gone about in some flawed way, which I'm not saying I know the answer to, but yeah. it seems like after all these decades, like if it hasn't improve there just must be something that they're doing that, that's wrong or is language just that complex <laughs> our lives yes our no. lives are complex and nuanced and to express it accurately and be understood there's to be honest it probably has to do with the fact that comp computer scientists aren't linguists and linguists mm. aren't com computer scientists until fairly recently and maybe that now will change in the next decade or two because more crossover is happening. Interesting. Yeah. Um, so, well, how does this affect the need to capture and document the endangered languages? I mean, if... What do you mean by that? Well, it's just that it's like, this is all we have left is you <laughs> going to remote corners of the world and walking in these villages and saying, okay, who here speaks something we don't have on record yet? I mean, how do you even do that? <laughs> right. It's okay. That, okay, this is, that's awesome. And it's also really really hard and it's not it's hard and it's very cost ineffective mm. okay so um the first thing we can do um is try to get okay so the really the only realistic result we realized in our organization a couple of years ago was we have to bring the science to the people we have to somehow start training people how to do this. So for a while we were running these workshops all over, but again, that became sort of cumbersomely time consuming and expensive. Uh, and, and people lose their equipment and, and things erode because they're at, you know, they're right by the seacoast and for like nine months they're already like corroded with salt water that's blowing in and out off the sea and whatever. You know, so it's like, you know, things are just going total definition of snafus, right? You know, like so. And, and, and so, you know, we realized that that wasn't really something that, we, that was sustainable either. So what, what was sustainable was developing something that was really great uh, tool that everyone could use that would enable them to start doing something. And that something which people can do is they can record stories and they can record words, okay? So they can build dictionaries. So dictionaries take a lot of people, many, many years to build. And so citizen science for dictionaries is a good thing because people, communities can own these dictionaries sort of as a collective communal process. So, the, so citizen science is what we're trying to do now. So we spent two years almost developing this app. We have this Basically, we're on the end run of it, and we're trying to raise money for it right now because we don't have enough money to finish it. But the long and short of it is that this is really awesome, and it's going to like solve one problem at least, which is bringing citizen science to the dictionary realm. Okay, and that's the talking dictionary. So, photo, 
uh, all kinds of, uh, you know, the audio. Uh, so, you know, uh, so it's a very nice multimedia, mobile, creatable, mobile friendly. And you don't even have, so one of the, a couple of the big things we solved with this, which were big hurdles to solve. One was really able to scrolling things on the international phonetic alphabet, which has like hundreds of symbols, right? But it worked. We, we finally figured that out. Um, and the other one was to be able to get it to record all the functionality offline where they didn't have no connectivity, but when they got somewhere where it did, it would automatically upload. Okay. That was a big hurdle because that's a reality in a large part of the world, right? Because they might go, they might, that only happen like one every once a couple of weeks or once a month or something that happens, right? But that has to be able to happen. But they can still record words, right? So that was a, uh, and those two hurdles were really big for us, and, and so that's so we're testing it out right now around the world, and it's working quite well. Mm. So we're very happy. Yeah. Now I've seen some videos of you <laughs> sitting with people, capturing these languages and just pointing to body parts and making note phonetically, I guess, yeah, exactly. what they say. Right, right, and I continue to like to do that, and we'll do that for for various languages. There's, as you said, there's only so many me's, and there's yeah. only so many uh, real, you know, situations where that you can do that, and. And much better for long-term sustainability of language documentation is to bring it down to the level of people such that we can create tools as linguists that allow them to create a storehouse, a, a corpus at least, that then allows people who can't get physical access over there but who may have the technical skills to then create materials that will that be useful for those people and you know and in so far as they don't even have to so you have all of these students okay you have all, like all of these talented students at these universities and these fancy liberal arts colleges okay and they can't go to places that are really dangerous or really technically uh implausible, impractical for whatever reason, okay? They're high in the mountains, they have war, disease, blah, 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 okay? This all involves high insurance costs with these, you know, you understand what I'm saying? So like, so you can match skills of students who have certain skill sets and the reality of people who can make corp, you know, corpora of data of these languages and match them together so that they can create things without them ever needing to per se be together except for possibly in some celebratory end of thing where you know they get together somewhere in a neutral place it's like to boldly go where no american man has gone before right well <laughs> so it's like there's only so much of that that anyone wants to ever do right is one thing so <laughs> So you were talking about how, you know, some of the value in capturing these languages and the reason why we would want to rescue aspects of them before they just go away. And one being the history and the, the, the landscape, maybe the geography even. Uh, but what do you feel are some of the most valuable lessons? I, I read on the Living Tongues website about, uh, you know, this other value in it is that there are lessons in there. There, there is a, you know, a storehouse of information that, that could be useful to us. So, you know, what do you feel are some of the most valuable lessons that w were in danger of being lost because they represented traditional knowledge that was encoded into these ancestral languages, as you put it? Right. Well, um, there are yet to be discovered systems of encoding these things. I mean, in any one project that you might be working on of these languages that are shifting away, so they're in danger, and thus these systems, by definition, are endangered, right? They're being lost. Um, you know, so... I think of it as like lessons, like what have you come across in your travels that seem like, oh, wow, I'm glad we're capturing this. There had to be moments when a light bulb went on. Wow, I never knew this in English, but now well, I'll that tell they... you a lesson I learned <laughs> recently. I don't know if this is going to answer your question. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm going to have another sip. Yeah. So Sora, which is oh, so in the linguist, the movie we made, um, one of the languages they, they chose to focus on was the Sora language, which was sort of by accident and kind of... It's not really super endangered. Um... It's related to a language called Jirai that is endangered, 
but um, Jirai is like a variety of Sora, basically. But it's divergent enough to be its own language, arguably. Okay. The system of Sora is, is a mixed number system. It's mixed base 12, base 20. Okay. So um, it, up to 12, it's like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. And then 13 is 12, 1, 12, 2, 12, 3, 12, 4, 12, 5 up to 12, seven, uh, where it's 19, and then 20 is 120, basically. Literally something that's one and then 20, and then it's 121, 122, 123, and then up to 12, that is 32, and then it goes to 120, 12, one, so 33, like that. Mm. So, so, so it's this mixed system that rolls over at the 23, 53, 73, 93, like that. So it's a somewhat complex system. Um, and, um, you know, you, you wonder how did that system arise? Like, why? Um, moreover, recently, so we've been surveying Sora. So we got this grant to work on Sora. So we've been working on varieties of Sora that haven't been documented before. Like one's in its original homeland area and one's in diaspora, like in other states of India where they work on tea gardens. That, but in some cases left like 150 years ago, so multiple generations. And so they're different varieties, basically, at this point. So anyway. Um, and one of these varieties is, is not like that at all. It's a, it's a normal base 10 system, like, like English, a decimal system, right? Like 10 and then 11 is 10, 1, 10, 2, 10, 3, like that, up to, you know, and then 20. And then, and then it's, you know, Basically, it's a, it's a 20, 30, 40. It's a, it's a decimal system, so it's nothing like the, the system that you see in, in, in some of these other varieties. So um, anyway, uh, so we're uh, watching, I'm watching one day someone count, and they're going, so, you know, so it's, they're not using each digit. Like They've got go multiple one, spots two, on like each this, digit. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, seven, 11, 12. That makes perfect sense oh. if they go back. 13, 14, 15. That's cool. Yeah. So that, that, and then as it turns out, this 20 word is a, is a word that's all over all these different languages in this part of the world. Uh, so it's just like a, some kind of market word. So it's like, so it's this overlay on that other system of, Counting it like that, so. Uh, so the lesson is kind of don't be limited by single finger, single digit counting yeah, yeah. on each digit. Exactly. You, you've got three spots there at least. Right, exactly. I see one, two, yeah. three, four, even maybe. Yeah. This right. could be 16 right here. Right, you, yeah, exactly. I guess my hands and their hands are similar, so I have three, and so it makes extra. But it's so funny, like, so I, you know, for a long time I couldn't figure out what it was, and then I saw so much, I was like, oh my God, how'd you know? Of course that's what that is. But, so can you think of any other lessons, like some bit of wisdom that, that you saved from being gone because it, it was inherent in the language? Yeah, okay, like, yeah. Um, I, first of all, no linguist would ever say they saved. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that may be extreme, but I don't know, just something that was like, wow, I'm glad I, I'm glad I looked into this language because I wouldn't have known that thing if not for hearing it in this language. All That's, kinds of things like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. And you okay. can come to mind. <laughs> um, well, one, like I said, like almost any language that you work on, you're going to find things like this in. So what comes to mind are things that I'm working on now. Mm, sure. Okay, so it's hard, it's hard for me to like, you know, think of anything other than stuff that happens, you know, I happen to be working on right now. Yeah. Okay. So um, one of these languages uh, that w I've been working on documenting has this really interesting system of uh, classifying plants in their names. Um, and that was quite a revelation, I must say. It's very complicated and I've only started to scratch the surface because I'm only, you know, I've only processed some of the data, but we have like 800 plant names. Um, and, you know, after doing like 80 of them, so like a tenth of them or 100 maybe, let's say 120, the system was, you know, some, some grains of the system became evident. So, you know, anyway, that, 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 that's a, that was a, that's one of these moments where we're like, wow, this system is really cool because it combines all kinds of different stuff. It's like 
economic value, food value, danger value, stuff like that. So it's of just, these plants. Yeah, yeah. Of these plants. So that 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 to me, and so and and then within economic value, sometimes like specific types of economic value like whether it can be made into rope for example yeah yeah no okay. that's good like it's yeah. edible is it medicine is it is it dangerous that that right. you would only know because it was documented these, like, in these languages like suffixes basically on the names of these things and, and and that 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 is a cool system right and when i realized that i was like wow this is really freaking cool mm. So like I have these aha moments like that all the time where you you, you get something. Um, what so. what about what what lessons have you learned just about life and people and and humanity through the work that you've been doing? Well, okay, that's a better question I think, um, just because um, it's perhaps easier to answer. So of course I've had the chance to meet a lot of people, a lot of really interesting, wonderful, intelligent people, people who are largely self-taught uh, people who don't have, who haven't had opportunities, but are very, I mean, they might, you know, have gone to high school or something or whatever, but you know, they, don't, they haven't really had uh, the kinds of uh, education that their intellect merits. Um, and, um, you know, I'm humbled by a lot of the, these people's um, wisdom, their their intelligence, their just their sharpness, how quickly they pick up on things that are very complicated. And pe when I know people who are scholars who have like PhDs in linguistics who don't have such understandings of things, right? So to me, sometimes I'm just like, oh my god. So uh, yeah, and that that happens all the time, you know, you know, I. I that happens a couple times a year, and you know, so that those that's of course the best part of my job is that you know, getting to like meet people who are really really awesome and who you get to have these long term meaningful relationships with. So that you know, most of those people end up being co authors with me on papers at some point. Or <laughs> I will say. So yeah. you've made. Living Tongues, your life work, it, obviously it's, it's important to you. And I, you know, Soul has been my life work for a few years now. It's important to me. I, I think it's that same impulse to care and to do something and to put our brain power and our energy and attention to work um, on behalf of something bigger than ourselves. So how can the Living Tongues Project help us unite our human family around that common goal of just nurturing ourselves, each other, and our precious planet? Mm, right. Okay. So it, very specifically, okay. So um, one of the things we need to do is make sure that people maintain their languages, okay? In this, to go back to the beginning of what we're saying, this um, form of additive multilingualism or bilingualism, uh, this allowing that rather than this ideology of subtractive monolingualism to dominate, okay? Because it's been shown that people are better off, minority communities, disadvantaged economically communities, however manifested, but specifically ethnic minority communities, um, are definitely better off if they can keep their language and, uh, and use the language of the majority community rather than not. And that's seen in like every demographic thing that you possibly want to see, crime rates and drug use and incarceration rates and graduation rates and average salary and blah, blah, blah. Pick, take your pick, mm. okay? Take your demographic thing that you want to have positive, you know, <laughs> that it, it's, it's better if they do than if they don't, okay? So it, um, in, in that sense, um, everyone is better off, okay? And you know, there's other reasons, medical reasons, your brain is healthier if you speak more than one language than if you speak just one um, on average four and a half years before dementia sets in on bilinguals and in monolinguals. But well, you are never gonna get, get dementia, man. That's the crisis. <laughs> you know what? There are some linguists like uh, this guy, uh, Wolf um, Leslau was his name. He's dead now, but he lived to be like 107. And he was like writing books 
right to the very end, right? You know, so it's, yeah, yeah, he's my hero. Um, yeah, I hope, I hope to, that will be true for me too, of course. But um, yeah, well, a- anyway, that, you know, so communal health, societal health, just by promoting multilingualism is a pretty low investment cost, high impact uh, result. So that, that, that to me is, is, is how um, we can help is by finding ways, as I was saying, to make it easy for people to keep their languages and to promote their languages in ways that are fun and contemporary and having a mobile thing on your phone that talks to you and you can um, eventually we'll be able to get it. But the bandwidth thing with video is kind of a pain in the ass right now. So eventually when that becomes more realistic and probably like four or five, ten years or something, where it'll be really easy to have streaming video and all kinds of things that are easily compressed and stuff, which is not really now. But um, so, but eventually we'll have you know that in in these things. So um, you know these are fun things and and they're. They're good for people to use, and that makes them likely to use them, right? So because they're fun, and 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 so it's kind of like learning without knowing or whatever. So, so with um, Living Tongues, your nonprofit organization, your mission is saving, preserving endangered languages before right. they are gone and lost. You're documenting and recording them and honoring the people who are clinging to their heritage As- and their culture and their assisting language. Assisting in main- main- maintenance of their languages. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, a, it's a worthy mission, yeah. and uh, we appreciate and applaud your right work. On, and uh, keep it up. God, you've gone far and wide, and I'm sure you have a long, long ways to go. How, any idea, like a number, how many languages have you, have you worked with documenting at personally? Living Tongues? At Living Tongues. Um, well, we, I and other people, oh, it's over 150. 150. Okay, yeah. so out of 7,000, you're 150. Okay, you're, you're, on, you're getting We're on our way. <laughs> well, you have More to, power to you, yeah, I mean. Uh, it, it could be as high as 200, yeah, uh, okay. I guess, if we include the people who've taken part in the uh, various workshops that have done some things, okay. but not like a... You know, and not all 7,000 are endangered anyway. No, they aren't. So. But, but you were there, I read some statistic on your website. Half of the languages might be gone yeah. by mid-century, or was it 2,100? The, the numbers that I have recently more or less compiled myself, which differ from other numbers that exist out there, are... Um, about you're looking at let's say 3900 languages are either threatened or endangered so that's more than half you need some help yeah what do you need the most at living tongues Uh, money or experts or money for sure because (laughs) we have lots of people that could get we could pay there are a lot of experts Mm -hmm. money is the main thing a lot of unemployed experts yeah that's the main thing Say la vie, though. <laughs> all right. Well, like I said, more power to you and, yeah, and much Thanks gratitude for, and appreciation for all you're all doing on behalf of, of all of us. Yeah. And so we always love to wrap yeah. with a hug, my okay. man.